Thank you so much, and what a thrill to be here. Thank you, Minister Haidu and the whole team. Uh, also on behalf of the Rotman School, our Dean, Dr. Tiff Macklem, uh, and the Institute for Gender and the Economy, we've been so thrilled to partner uh, with Minister Haidu and the department on putting together this event. And to see all the tables full, to see you all here is just really extraordinary. So I'm, I'm just um, thrilled to be here. And I've been asked to sort of set the stage for the series of conversations that we're begin going to be having over the next uh, day and a half. So I thought what I would try to do is sort of highlight some of the crucial issues and think also about some of the myths that we're trading on that might actually be getting in the way of us making progress. I want to think about how we can change the conversation. In fact, I titled the, my presentation Rebooting the Gender Equality Conversation because I think it's 2019, I think it's just time <laughs> that we had a new conversation, one that can actually move the needle faster than we've been moving it. And I think it's particularly important because uh, you know, now more than ever, we're coming to realize that even after decades of trying, talking about these issues, making efforts, I mean, you talk to most people and companies, they're really you know, working hard to improve diversity. And yet, when you look at the numbers, gender equality is actually often sliding backwards. And especially when you compare Canada to some peers you know, who have been making a little bit more progress than us, we are slipping back in the rankings. And so I think this is a moment for us to really think something about what we've been doing up until now has not been working as well as it should, and what can we do that's different? And so, uh, as Dominique mentioned, my background is as an innovation scholar. Uh, my goal here is to help us think about how can we be innovative in addressing these challenges and opportunities. Um, part of the challenge is that even as we have made progress in bringing women into the workforce, uh, we have not necessarily done a very good job of making them feel included. So we've talked about diversity and now we talk about inclusion. And that shift from diversity to inclusion I think has been a really important one precisely because it's not enough to count. It's not enough to say, well, we brought these people in because they're not gonna stay, they're not gonna thrive, they're not gonna perform if they don't feel fully included. And this is particularly true when we consider women with intersecting identities such as ability, race, ethnicity, indigenous women, uh, women from lower socioeconomic status. So we have to be very thoughtful about not only bringing more women into different economic opportunities, but finding ways to include them. Um, so uh, I got thrown off by the French there for a minute. It's so exciting to have someone translate all my English into French, and I apologize for not being able to speak better French. Next year on my sabbatical, my goal is to actually get my French back so that I could read this slide to you just as well as I can read this slide to you. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, but if we look at the leadership gap, we can see exactly uh, what this problem looks like. So, um, if we think about in Ontario, where we've now had comply or explain regulation as part of the Ontario Securities Commission for now going on four years, despite that, we see that 40% of TSX listed companies still have no women in the executive officer position, and only 30% have more than one and only 4% of CEOs are women. So this doesn't look like progress. This doesn't look like the world when I got out of university in 1986. This doesn't look like the world that people promised me at that point. They said, oh look, your generation, it's gonna be good for you. And I'm like, uh-huh. So not yet, but we're getting there. Um, and if we look at uh, boards of directors, we just saw Stats Can actually put out a report two days ago uh, that shows that if we look across all of Canada, both public and private companies, only 19.6% of board seats are held by women. And the vacated board seats are being filled, only about less than 30% of them are being filled by women. So at that replacement rate, we're not gonna hit parity until 2050 or beyond. So we really have a big uh, challenge here. And this goes all the way back in the pipeline. This is not just uh, boards of directors. That's just very visible. We, it is something we can count. But if you look throughout the pipeline in organizations, you'll see that on average for every 100 men that are promoted uh, to manager, only 79 uh, women are promoted. So at that rate, you can understand why when we get to look at the corporate leadership, we have situations like this. In the Fortune 500, <laughs> there are almost as many CEOs named John as there are women altogether. 
So if your name is John, you're like got better, better chance at this point than all the rest of us. So, um, and, and this is you know, what we're trying to solve for. We're trying to solve for representation. We're trying to solve for economic opportunity. And this is just uh, one signal uh, to the fact that um, we, don't, we, we have not gotten there yet. And we have to then wake up and say, something has to change. We can't be satisfied with incrementalism. So I founded the Institute for Gender and the Economy two and a half years ago um, because I, I, I thought maybe one of the reasons that we aren't making progress is that we're having a stale conversation that we are trading on some of the same rhetorical notions that maybe aren't even true. And I knew as an academic researcher, I knew some of the things people were saying weren't true based on the research. And yet people are very wedded to certain ideas. And so the idea, what I want to share with you today is what some of the research actually says with the hope that that can give us some insights, ideas for changing practices, for changing uh, what we do, for changing policy, for changing strategy that can um, push us forward. So the idea is let's actually pay attention to the research and let's see if we can use that as a source of inspiration. I should also mention that we are going to have mic runners later and so there'll be an opportunity for all of you to ask questions. So I'm not going to go for my full allotted time. I'm really hoping to open this up for uh, a dialogue. So be thinking about what your questions might be. Um, so let me start before I dig in uh, because what I want to do is use the research to do some myth busting. But in order to do some myth busting, I have to sort of explain the origins of some of the challenges that we face. So this is um, the, uh, uh, the results of uh, 17 million people or more who have taken the implicit association test. How many of you have taken this test? OK, not as many as I would have thought. So it's an online test that anyone can take. You can just Google implicit at Harvard, and you get an opportunity to take. This one is in particular about women in careers, but you can take one about race, about women in STEM, about LGBTQ Q and other things. It's basically 25 ways to make you hate yourself because <laughs> Because as you can see from this bar chart, when it comes to uh, associating men with careers and women with family, which is a bias that many of us have automatically in our brains, this is not what we wish we thought. This is what our brains are doing for us. Um, most of us associate women with family and men with careers. And that be, is a really major challenge because what this test does is look at our pre-conscious kind of processing. And the reason that this is so important, okay, we all have biases. One, it's important for us to recognize that we all have it. By the way, men and women are no different. This is not men are biased and women are somehow so awesome. Actually, women are just as biased as men. We all are reinforcing this system. And on top of that, it's not just that our brains have these automatic processing, that's how our brains work. We're animals that have learned to categorize because that helps us process the myriad data that we're getting all the time. So our brains naturally do it. So it's very hard to get your brain to change its categorization system. The challenge for us is that these, this categorization is now built into all of our systems and processes and procedures and everything we do in a company. How we think about what a leader looks like when we're thinking about who should we promote. Somehow, because we associate women with family and men with careers, men look more promotable to us in a pre-conscious level. Uh, similar with women entrepreneurs. Why do we have 2.7% of all venture capital going to women entrepreneurs? It's because we don't think of women in that role. Again, pre-consciously. It's not that we're walking around saying, you know, we don't wake up in the morning and go, I'm going to be super sexist today. Like, that's just not how it works. It's just how our brains work. And then the problem is it's embedded in systems. So I want to show how that then plays out economically for us. So let's start with the first myth, uh, because it plays out in particular in this myth of meritocracy. So many people, I'm sure you've all heard this, we can't do a diversity program, we can't hire this women, we can't set targets, we can't set quotas, because that would be non-meritocratic, and it would actually get in the way of having high performance, true quality, and all those kinds of things. Well, a lot of academic scholars have been intrigued by that excuse that people have given. And so they said, what if we completely control for quality 
and we just look to see how the bias is playing out. So here's an example of three different studies that were done. The first one, Jennifer and John on the left, people, a whole bunch of hiring managers were sent the resumes of someone, and the resumes were identical. Every single word on the resume was identical, except for some had the name Jennifer at the top, and some had the name John at the top. When you then ask the hiring managers, and this was done over many, many hiring managers, who was more hireable, John is more hireable than Jennifer, and there is literally no difference in quality. Okay, think about the world of investing that I just mentioned. A lot of the excuses made both by VCs in Toronto and in Silicon Valley is that, well, women are just not proposing equal quality ventures and that's why we're not funding them. If they had good ideas, we would do it. So uh, some friends of mine actually did an experiment where they took the exact same pitch deck from a, from a startup, same PowerPoint, they wrote a script and they showed the PowerPoint with the, with the narration of the script to a whole bunch of investors and asked them, would you invest in this opportunity? And the only thing they manipulated was whether a woman read the script or a man read the script. So male voice versus female voice. Exact same pitch. It turns out when you ask the investors, would you invest in this, the male voice is twice as investable as the female voice. Okay, now you're thinking, maybe they're thinking other stuff. The woman might somehow magically get pregnant and have a baby and get in the way of her entrepreneurial activities. We, you, know, you can't help all the things that people are thinking about. So let's go to something where it doesn't even involve humans. Another experiment where they had a whole bunch of people work on computers and they had them do tasks. And after the tasks, they asked them to rate the quality of the computer in terms of its ability to perform the tasks. And all the computers are basically rated the same. They then asked people, how much is this computer worth? Some people were told their, that their computer's name was Julie. Some people were told that their computer's name was James. James is worth more than Julie. It's a computer, for goodness sake. It can't get pregnant. Like, <laughs> this is not about anticipating some weird future where women magically can't do their job when they have children. Like, this is just not. So what we're seeing is this, these biases get built into our decision-making processes that then lead to these unfair, unequal economic outcomes uh, for women in all sorts of uh, domains. So in fact, uh, the problem with the myth of meritocracy is, is just that. It's a myth that in fact, um, you have to put your thumb on the scale to level the playing field. Okay, that was a mixed metaphor, but <laughs> what I mean is that meritocracies actually reproduce inequality. And if you are gonna actually be meritocratic, you have to contravene all of the weight that's put around uh, the male gender with this association with career and the female um, being associated with uh, family. Okay, myth number two, closely related to this. We have a leaky pipeline. You ask people on boards, we can't find the women. I'm like, there's 2,500 board, you know, board certified women out there waiting to be on board. So I'm not sure about that excuse. But on a certain level, it is true because we only have 4% of CEOs of companies being women. Um, that, you know, and that's the kind of person you're looking for for a board, maybe we have a problem. Well, what is the system that produces that 4%? A lot of people say is women's choice. Women opt out of certain high-powered careers that are gonna lead them up into the, to, the, to the workforce. And so they say these gender gaps are a product of choice. Um, but here's the problem with, the, uh, with this argument that women are choosing uh, these outcomes. It has to do with the fact that these outcomes are, these choices are actually structured by the context in which people operate. So let's take, for example, care work. More, six in 10 elder care providers are women. If you look at the number of hours worked per week on unpaid work, you have a vast difference between women and men on unpaid childcare and on domestic work. And so what happens is women are experiencing a time famine that then is gonna structure their choices. If they feel that they have a time famine, it's going to force them in some way to choose to not work as hard, to not be you know, the go-getter who's gonna put themselves up for that next promotion. So women are not actually opting out. They're being forced out of the system by gendered expectations about who should be doing care work at home 
and by workplaces that are not making it possible for women, given that they are the ones who are expected to work at home, and that, that by the way, would love to change that too, uh, workplaces that are not actually allowing women to make the accommodations that they need to um, handle these issues. And there was a really interesting article in the New York Times that just came out a couple of weeks ago, just in time for me to get it into this presentation, which talks about a whole stream of research uh, that has basically shown that over the course of the last few decades, the returns to working those extra jobs with extra long hours, the 50 plus, 60 plus hours, think Bay Street, think a law firms and things like that, the returns, the earnings that you can make for doing that are disproportionately higher than just the amount of hours that you work. And so the point that they make in this article, which is quite interesting, if you imagine a heterosexual couple, a man and a woman, they're both in high powered go-go jobs, they decide to have a family. They have a family and for anyone who's had children or even people like me who haven't but have seen people who've had children, you know <laughs> that there's things like the baby gets sick at daycare, you have to come up and, and, and pick the kid up. Uh, school vacations, uh, sports after school, uh, ballet after school, whatever it is, someone needs to be more flexible. So you have two high power jobs and because of gender norms in society, it's often the woman who ends up taking a step back. She, she maybe doesn't quit the wor world of work, maybe, Maybe she just goes into a job that's slightly less demanding, more controllable hours, more flexibility. But we know from statistics like this that those jobs are not paid as much. And by doing that, she actually enables her spouse to work that go-go job, to work the 60, 70, 80 hours a week traveling and doing all of that stuff. So what the article says is it's not, a lot of people say, well, it made sense for the woman to step back, she was earning less, or she's earning less. But in fact, it's the very fact that she steps back that allows the man to earn more because she's enabling that ability to work like that. So it kind of it reverses our notion of what the causality is around work and family and the differential in wages and it also explains a lot of the gender wage gap. So men earn more if the female partner actually opts out. Uh, it's not that they intrinsically move, earn more, it's that You've, we've created a system that allows them to do that. Okay, this closely relates to the gender wage gap. So these numbers that I'm showing here are approximate. The, depending, uh, my economist friends in the room will tell you they're probably you know, looking at this with shock and horror because um, there's a lot of precision that goes into calculating the gender wage gap. There are many, many different ways of calculating it precisely. But I just am showing this to give you a sense of the general sources of the wage gap. And a lot of times we focus on issues around equal pay for equal work and pay equity. And those are extremely important. But most of that over the course of the last 20 years, we have actually made progress on that, in part because of the regulations and legislation that we've had. We have made progress on that part. Where we haven't made as much progress is on the other sources of the wage gap. Most of it has to do with job segregation. That means women working in different kinds of jobs than men, jobs that pay less. So just like I talk about women stepping back when they have children, the evidence that we have from countries where the data is, avail is available, uh, for example, in Denmark and other places, which we think of Denmark being so egalitarian, they still have an 88 cents wage gap. And the reason they do is because women are still career switching at the time of the birth of their first child to go into a more flexible, controllable work a job, but it's probably gonna pay less. We're actually, I have some of my colleagues who are in the room here today, we're actually trying to do this exact same study for, for Canada. We've been on a, I think, two year long, uh, fantastically interesting odyssey with StatsCan to see if we can actually get the data. Um, but at some point, we will know what this looks like uh, in the Canadian context as, w as well. And then, of course, there's another wage gap that has to do with a lot of women going into part-time work, often, again, because they have families, and that's leading to more wage gap. I should also point out that this is the overall average wage gap, but if we look at uh, women with intersecting identities, women of color, that wage gap is much higher. For example, in the United States, Latina women earn 54 cents on the dollar of a white man. 
Here, the gap between visible and minority men and women is 72 cents and 92 cents between visible and non-visible minority women on average. So we know that this gap is even bigger for people who have the most uh, 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 challenges uh, in the economy. Okay, so we think the career gaps are a product of choice, but in fact, these choices are structured by society. And so we have to stop saying women are choosing to opt out uh, and start thinking about what are the structures that are pushing women out of those opportunities, those economic opportunities. Okay, third myth. So maybe if we have this problem of there being inequality in society, we should fix the women. And that's been the focus, I think, of a lot of the work over the last 20 years, exemplified by Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In, but the idea that women need to train, we need to train women to be more self-confident, we to need to uh, help them negotiate their salaries more, they should just lean in and be assertive and put themselves at the table. Right? Well, the problem with that recommendation is that there's a lot of research evidence that suggests that when women do that, they get pushback because they are leaning into a system that doesn't want to see women be assertive to negotiate because a man negotiating looks different to people than a woman negotiating. And so we talk about this as the double bind that women, we want women to kind of participate in the economy, but at the same time, they're gonna get pushback if they try to do things. So then you get like, you know, breakout sessions on how can women be more likable, you know? I was like, I'm so done with that. It's so great to be in my 50s, because I'm like, I don't care. You don't have to like me. Uh, <laughs> just like literally do not care, but, um, <laughs> But like, I, we, I mean, even I've caught, I mean, I'm trying to shut it down, but even here at the business school, sometimes you see, you know, sessions for the young women about how they can be more likable in the workplace. And I'm just like, ah. So, but that's what happens because, the, because of this double bind. The moment that you're competent, you're seen as unlikable, and you, it's very hard for women to be competent and likable at the same time. So a lot of this lean in idea is predicated on the idea that men and women are somehow essentially different. And by the way, I'm talking all in the gender binary right now, but we clearly recognize that there are uh, many different kinds of gender identities, but most of the data collected is just on the binary, so that's what I'm gonna show you. So we think, oh, well, men and women are different. Women are more risk averse, all kinds of things like that, and so we have to deal with that difference between men and women. And it is true there are differences between men and women. For example, in Canada, on average, women are 5'4". On average, men are 5'9". But look at the distribution. There's plenty of men who are shorter than plenty of women, but the average, okay, there's actually, on average, a real difference. Let's look at risk taking. We all have this idea women are more risk averse. In fact, when you do controlled studies where you take away the context, what you see is there's almost no difference in risk aversion. And in fact, where you see results that show that women are more risk averse than men, it's because sometimes researchers are also biased. Published results that, um, don't show that women are more risk averse because reviewers don't believe it and editors don't believe it and it doesn't seem like an exciting finding. And so when you actually go back and look at all the unpublished results, this is, the, this is what you get. You get almost a perfect overlap between uh, men and women. Some women are more risk seeking, some men are more risk seeking, some women are more risk averse, some men are more uh, risk averse. Uh, so I think we have to take into account that that's a myth that we have that helps perpetuate some of the dynamics that we see. Now, you're thinking to yourself, but I know, even myself, I'm a woman, I do feel like I lack self-confidence or confidence in certain situations. Well, to me, that actually says that in most situations, we're actually asking women to take more risks than men, even what looks like an identical situation. If you are a female entrepreneur and you wanna pitch a startup, and you know that only 2.7% of money goes to female-led businesses, for you to take the time and effort to invest and then go pitch a startup, you have to take so much more risk than the average man because the chance that you're gonna get funded is so much lower. So it's not that women are more risk averse, it's that we're putting them in a society that makes them take so many more risks every time they walk out the door. So some of my colleagues thought about a way to, to, to manipulate this, um, to see if we could make that behavior go away. And so they did an experiment where people did tasks, and in doing the tasks, they were uh, first offered 
uh, to um, actually just get paid per task, like piece rate. So you always knew exactly how much you were going to get paid. The, and then the other task that they asked, the, the other way that they paid them was to get them to actually enter a tournament where they had a chance of being paid four times as much, but also a chance of not being paid at all. So the average of the, 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 the expected value of both of those was the same, but one felt like I knew exactly how much I was going to earn, and the other one is you had a chance to earn a lot more or not. When you ask people, OK, we're going to pay you the fixed rate for each task, but you can opt into the risky one, the tournament, what you found was that many more men than women opted in to the tournament, 72% versus 47%. However, if you simply change what we call the choice architecture, the structure around the choice, and you said you're all in the risky one, but you can opt out to do the safe one, the known one, then you completely eliminate the difference between men and women simply by changing the structure within which people are making the choice. So this has nothing to do with women being more or less risk averse. It has to do with the context that you put people in. And this is the kind of research that we're doing to try to come up with practical things that organizations um, can do. OK. Another consequence of leaning in, again, by some colleagues of mine, um, including an outstanding doctoral student, uh, Joyce He, on the consequences of leaning in. Uh, and she's done a series of experiments, but we also have some evidence, and this is straight, our dean is now in the room, so he will see this. We're going to be working with his team on this. This is straight from our own MBA admissions data. When people apply for their MBA they, uh, here, they are asked to also put in five words that describe themselves. And so we, what we thought was, let's look at the words that people use to describe themselves and categorize them by neutral words, feminine words and masculine words. Masculine words being excellence and assertive and commanding and feminine words being collaborative, uh, nice, you know, those kinds of things. And what we found is that as women used fewer feminine words, which you think you would want to do, you're applying for an MBA, it's like this business world, why wouldn't you want to try to conform to that norm? They actually got penalized because they were what the theory that we have behind this is that they're defying our gendered expectations. So it's this, again, this double bind. You want to go into the work world, but then if you don't like, emphasize your feminine characteristics, you get penalized for not being feminine enough. And similarly with men, if they use too many feminine words, they also don't. And this is sort of like the first screen before we interview people and things like that. By the way, this is not to critique our own business school because this was replicated in another study that looked at people actually how they wrote their cover letters and resumes. And um, we found the same thing. When you were applying for jobs that were in masculinized kind of settings, like say a banking job or something like that, then people, women tended to take out the feminine language, but when they did, they were actually penalized because they did it. So it's a double bind because we have these complex expectations about what a woman should be. I find this myself in the classroom. I'm tough in the classroom, and they, my students want me to simultaneously be nurturing, and I don't know much about that stuff. So I'm not much of a nurturer. So you know, sometimes they're like, oh, she's so tough. And, I'm, you know, like, and that you know, offends some people because people expect women to also while we also are willing to you know, accept them as you know, workers in the workforce, we also expect them to somehow demonstrate these nurturing uh, characteristics. So we have to fix the women. The answer is no. It can be counterproductive, actually, in a system that's designed to push back on that. And instead, I think we really need to think about how we can fix the systems, the structures, the choice architectures around women. OK. Myth number four. Controlling bias is about controlling the individuals. If we don't have to fix the women, let's fix our bias, right, inside organizations. And so a lot of companies have gone big into diversity training, implicit bias training, and the like. Well, what we found, this is a series of studies done by Frank Dobbin at Harvard and a number of his colleagues, Alexander Kalev and others, is that um, when you do things like mandatory diversity training, and what this chart shows is the change in representation over five years after having done these initiatives. What we find is things like mandatory diversity training, job tests, and grievance systems, all of those things that are meant to fix individual bias, 
actually most of them backfire. Anything in orange and red means you had a decrease in representation of women, uh, uh, African Americans, this was done mainly in the states, Hispanic people, Asian people. However, when you actually do interventions that are more focused on structural changes like diversity task force, having diversity managers, targeted uh, recruiting with uh, targets or quotas, you actually find you get major increases. So again, trying to fix our brains, our brains are, fun are, are, are meant to categorize. It's very hard to fix our brains. So instead, what we find from the research is that fixing the structures around us is actually the more effective and important thing to do. So again, don't try to change our brains. <laughs> I mean, it's good. It's good for us all to take the implicit association test and know what our issues are, and it's good for us to be self-aware. But what we found is if you force everyone to do that, they're going to be very resentful because they're going to say, especially if they're in the dominant privileged group, oh, now you're just making me feel bad about myself. You're making me feel like the bad guy. So it, it backfires. A lot of these interventions can backfire if you don't couple them with the structural interventions and the accountability inside organizations. Okay, so myth number five. This is something that I thought hard about uh, in preparation for this uh, event because a lot of our attention and energy has been directed towards large corporations. They're very visible. We think if we can just have an impact on those companies, we're gonna be able to make a change on gender equality for, for our society. So uh, my team pulled together some statistics, including my colleague Carmina Ravanera, who's here, uh, who, talking about who the employers are and how many people are employed in those areas. And when you look at it, over here on the right are companies with 500 or more employees. That's 0.2% of all companies, and it's only 9.7% of all employees in the, in the private sector. When you look at small and medium-sized companies, 1 to 19, 20 to 99, 100 to 499, that's where all the action is. It's nearly all of the companies, it's almost 100% of the total companies, and it's about 90% of all private employment, 60% of all employment, because you, if you count government and other things, um, that goes down. So, so if we're going to intervene, we have to intervene with small and medium-sized enterprises because that's where most people are employed. And that's a much tougher nut to crack because those are, you know, large corporations. They have HR staffs and procedures and lawyers and all the stuff that you, all the all the apparatus that would allow you to be able to implement some procedures, changes, processes, and practices. But instead, what we're finding is that most employees don't work in those contexts. And how are we going to increase increase gender equality if we have to think hard about small and medium-sized enterprises? So. The challenge is they're still subject to a lot of the same regulations, pay equity, human rights code, and the, et cetera, but they lack financial resources and time. They lack HR management. They lack knowledge and guidance. They lack data about best practices. And yet, they're where most people work. And we don't think about it and talk about it enough. So I think we really have to focus in on this challenge. So that's myth number five. Okay. I'm going to give you some thoughts on solutions, and then I'm hoping to open it up for a few minutes uh, for conversation. So uh, I have been arguing, as I said in the beginning, that I think we need to think about gender equality as an innovation challenge. Uh, no offense to all of the human resources people in the room, but often what happens in companies is they basically say, oh, those issues, those are the HR people. We in the line of business don't need to worry about this. The HR people will do it. Well, the problem with that is, is it silos the challenge as opposed to involving everyone. Think about in most companies, when you think about innovation, new product development, new service development, uh, you know, re restructuring your supply chain and things like that, you put your best and your brightest people on it. You treat it as an investment. You treat it as something that's gonna drive growth and change in your organization. You don't think about it as a cost and a cost center and things like that, and yet, that's how we tend to think about diversity initiatives right now. And so my idea is if we could treat innovation as a gender, a gender, gender equality as an innovation challenge, we could actually unleash the incredible creativity and innovation that's available in most companies to think differently about these issues. Um, I keep, I, I wrote this article because it's 2017, obviously in 2017, inspired by 
uh, Prime Minister Trudeau's statement about his own uh, cabinet in 2015. And just every year, I just keep crossing it off. And now it's 2019. And you know, I will retire at some point. I really hope. So I'm hoping that I can stop crossing the number off and we can actually uh, say that we've made real progress. So let me give you four slides on what I think is next, just to summarize some possible solutions. So first, we have to think about women's time famine. <laughs> Because we cannot simply try to shove women into a system that's not designed to accommodate them. And that includes changing norms at home, because that imbalance in participation is just untenable. Um, that might involve uh, paternity leave uh, really being more balanced. We've made some progress on there, thinking about um, some use it or lose it paternity leave. But what we've learned from our research is that uh, men tend not to take paternity leave unless they have top up. And they, because they still have, there's still this gendered norm about men being providers. And so if we don't, an EI for many people is probably a not enough to actually survive on uh, if you look at the numbers. So thinking for companies about how you can give as good benefits to men as you do uh, to women. Um, subsidizing child care and elder care. I know that that's a political hot topic, but I think it is the most important thing that we can do to achieve gender equality. It's hugely expensive. But roads and bridges and factories and innovation superclusters are hugely expensive, and we spend on those things. And so this is a challenge not just for government at every level, but also a challenge for employers. Employers need to realize that they have to be investing in this as well. So this is not just a policymakers, you go fix it. This is a social system that we have to think about uh, changing. Um, flexible work arrangements. A lot of companies, at least larger companies, try to do this, but then the people who take advantage of them are stigmatized as being less committed. That doesn't work. That doesn't help with gender equality. You can't say that you're working on gender equality if you put in flexible work arrangements, but only women take them, use them, and then they're seen as, it's basically a second track. <laughs> so there's the gender wage gap right there. And then redesigning jobs. Here's the thing that I'm obsessed with right now, job design. Why do we design the jobs the way we do? Nine to five was designed for factory work for Model Ts in the early 20th century, right? We, that whole model, I think, is something that we have to really rethink. Technology can help us with that, but we have so many assumptions about how work should be done that are getting in the way of our ability to actually have everyone actualize. One of the reasons I left cons the consulting world and became an academic is because I wanted to spend as much time as possible in my pajamas. And academia, when you're writing, you can be anywhere in a cafe sipping a cappuccino. I mean, I work hard. I work super hard. But I just work a lot of the time in my pajamas, and I kind of enjoy that. Um, well, now that I'm running this institute, I have to suit it up more often than I would like. But, um, but so job design. Let's think about job design. And that was worth a lot of money to me. I left a lot of money on the table to leave consulting to, to become an academic. But that was worth it, because I wanted a job that was fit for me. And I think we could make more jobs fit for more people if we did that. Okay. Second, what's, what's next? Committed leadership willing to bust the status quo. We need courage. I am an American immigrant, and uh, Dominique was saying, oh, I remember you from that other conference because of your American accent. So uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, in some ways, look at Canada from the outside in. And I can tell you, Canada has this opportunity, especially looking right now what's happening south of the border in my home country, to really be a beacon of light uh, for change. But it is going to require us to really be brave to really take steps that are uncomfortable. Leaders have to show the way. They have to be committed. They have to actually not say that they're committed to w women in leadership, and then the next two appointments they make are for men in senior roles. Like That's just not how it can be done. Um, again, going back to the research, skipping mandatory diversity training, and instead focus on sponsorship, not just mentorship, voluntary training, targeted recruiting, and here I'm saying even quotas, diversity task forces, not just employee resource groups, um, diversity managers, and then hold people accountable, really. 
Most of the co companies I talk to, or the larger companies again, they'll say, oh yeah, d diversity in hiring is on their key performance ind indicators. But then when it comes down to the end of the year, if they hit their numbers, they didn't hit their, key, they didn't hit their diversity numbers, but they hit their financial numbers, in the end, they don't get penalized for it. We need to actually have people's financial incentives be connected to, uh, th to making progress or not being allowed to hire unless you actually are making progress on this. You have to hold people's feet to the fire. Okay, third, what's next? We have to solve for small and medium enterprises. It has not been on the radar. When we went looking for data on the practices that small and medium enterprises do to encourage diversity, we could not find any. So we need to collect more data, and we need to think about uh, the mechanisms for diversity inclusion in those settings. And for a lot of them, they don't have HR capacity. We need to find a way to support them through kind of special services that provide HR you know, support to these firms. And then I think because we really don't know how to do this, this is a great opportunity for innovation to collectively think about how could we do something really different when it comes to um, sharing kind of solutions across companies. Okay, my final what's next. We need to experiment and innovate. Literally most of the things we've tried doing don't work that well. <laughs> so we gotta do something different. I mean, that's the definition of insanity, is to just keep trying the same thing over and over again and hoping for a different outcome. It's just not gonna happen. Recognizing that there's no one size fits all. People come up to me and they say, so what are the three best practices? And I'm like, well, here's some things that have been tried, but it's gonna really depend on the culture of your company, the capabilities, the commitment of leadership, et cetera. Co-create with your employees. Don't think that you know all the answers. There's a lot that can be done through co-creation. I think that's the most powerful mechanism. Be willing to take risks. A lot of times we wanna to look to the left and the right and see what everyone else is doing. Don't do it, just do it. Just, just get out there and do something. Be willing to take risks and be willing to learn. We don't know all the answers, so you're gonna to have to try some things. They're not all gonna work and we're gonna to have to be willing to iterate uh, as we go. So I want to uh, now open it up and you know, have a chance for us to all talk together about this, but thank you very much for hearing some of my ideas. Okay. So we'd like to see if we have a hand.